many more delegates arriving than had registered. And uh, so we will probably be having to bring in some additional um, chairs, so please we'll do that as quietly as possible. Uh, if you have got a chair on your table, just put up your hand so that somebody can come and sit there and we can proceed. Uh, as Carol Lincoln said, we've clearly got to be very popular. So <laughs> this is wonderful. So it is a great pleasure to welcome you all to our first in-person conference since June 2019. It is wonderful to recognize so many of you again and to see so many new faces too. I'd like to give a special welcome to our funding partner. We are particularly privileged to have the president of the Kresge Foundation, uh, Rip Rapson, join us. Rip, without the support from Kresge Foundation, this would not have been possible. So, and all that we will report on in the course of this, uh, of this conference would not have been possible. And to you, Bill, our program officer, over my long career, I have engaged with well over 50 funding partners and have never engaged with someone so passionate about the work, so connected in it, so full of ideas, so encouraging, but never insistent. Thank you. And Ashley, um, Johan Johnson, I don't see where you are, but uh, it's good to be able to meet you. You'll all enjoy meeting Ashley as well as a new program officer at the Kresge Foundation. Also, a special welcome to one of our keynote speakers, Tim Fowler from the Tertiary Education Commission in New Zealand. New Zealand has also embarked on a student success journey, so it will be fascinating to hear more about their approach. To Carol Lincoln, Vice President and stalwart at Achieving the Dream, it is wonderful you are finally here. <laughs> Without your knowledgeable, consistent and imaginative support, we would have achieved a fraction of what we have. It's also a special welcome to representatives of the Department of Higher Education and to the previous DDG and Chief Director. Our partnership could not have happened without the University Capacity Development Grant, which has often supported the good ideas that have come up through the Sia Formulela Initiative. Uh, it has been an essential component and I'm pleased to say, uh, as you will hear on Friday, the UCDG will be continuing to support student success work uh, and you will continue to be able to uh, draw on that grant in, 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 as long as you propose it for your membership fees and for various of your activities. We are also pleased to welcome um, members from NISFAS, National Student Financial Aid. Um, again, we will see from some of the slides um, how very much uh, NISFAS how big a player this fuss has become in South African higher education. So four years ago, when we were in this very hall, we decided to have a great change. Instead of facing that way, we faced it this way. Um, we were not a network. We were five partner universities working together. And at that meeting, we presented an ambitious vision for the future of the Sia Pumalela network. This vision had been collaboratively developed over several interactions with many players. And today we plan to report back to you on what we have achieved and to clarify what still needs to be done. The Siapur Malela model has borrowed about from the concept of collective impact. Multiple members working collaboratively towards a common agenda with shared ways of measuring impact supported by a backbone team. Here we will see Sia Pumalela's agenda. This first one, establishing evidence-based student, sorry, establish a more student-centered culture in South Africa's higher education system to improve student completion rates and reduce, ideally eliminate, equity differences to expand evidence-based student success efforts on a national scale using a networked approach that builds on existing strengths and shares capacity. And then finally, improves institutional capacity to collect and use student data to improve student success across the higher education system. 
And I think we have made great progress in reaching in, in all of these purposes, but we still have a long way to go, perhaps particularly in the last. Um, rather than the community and the collective impact, in, they have a, a, a requirement of, a, um, of mutually reinforcing activities. We have emphasized the great importance of learning from each other. And I think almost every institution here can talk about how they have learned from another institution and put in place some of what that other institution has done. So this, <coughs> these are the components of the Siapo Malayla network. And you will see this uh, picture uh, many times in the course um, of this conference because we are trying to unpack the different components um, of the network. I'm going to start um, with the first one, and that is of the network members. You see number one down at the bottom. Their partners, their associates, and their participant members. You might wonder what the differences are. Um, well, in terms of the work, I'm not sure there are huge differences. It's just in terms of some funding. Um, the partner institutions have been given a grant from um, the Kresge Foundation. The associate was a previous partner who'd been given a grant, that's University of Pretoria, and have continued uh, to be involved. I think we have 18 members of the University of Pretoria uh, at this particular conference. And then participant members who belong to the network um, and have been given services um, by the network uh, and are in fact in most cases using the university development grants in order to carry the work, the work forward. During the conference, there will be presentations from each of the partners identifying the highlights of what they have achieved. There will be four today, starting at, I had said 9.45, it will be a little later, and three tomorrow from 10.15. I hope that we will be up to date by that time. There are inspiring titles like Building for Soretti, Evidence, Impact and Care, another one, Connecting Students for a Brighter Future, data integration and building a student success network. And finally, knowing, doing, and transforming, um, which you will see a little later is something we've probably not made as much progress as we would like, but is certainly on the agenda. At a great workshop yesterday of all the participant institutions, we heard of their most impressive achievements in the two and a half years, or in some cases, the one and a half years that they have been members. They will not be presenting in plenary, but they are offering uh, papers in the parallel sessions, so be, be sure to hear what they have to say. Let me just tell you what these, me these members are, and I'll be very quick. These were the uh, seven partners, and these are the participant institutions. And the ones in red are the ones who have joined us most recently. So that is 17 members out of 26 universities in South Africa. Um, and we do have many knocking at the door. You might wonder, uh, if, well let me just say, and I think Witty, who I see in the audience here from the CAT now, we were criticised in this room some years ago about working mainly with, you know, very well functioning, possibly some elite institutions, or mainly in elite institutions. Um, but I just wanted to give you some idea from some work that Charles um, <coughs> Shepherd has been doing for us of the different kinds of, uh, of the profile of these networks. So here is an enrollment by quintiles for the partners. And you'll see quintile one to three are the schools, quintile four to five, and then some private and others. Now there's huge variation amongst these partners, um, but it is really important to see that over 50% of Nelson Mandela University, UKZN, and the University of the Free State of their first full-time, at least their first time entry undergraduate students are from quintiles one to three schools. I suspect this puts South Africa's higher education system as one of the most inclusive in the world. 
Another indication of this is the NISFA sponsors, uh, those, those students who are sponsored in the partner institutions. And once again, we see some amazing figures here. UKZN, nearly 80% of their students are NISFAS um, sponsored. And to be NISFAS sponsored, your family must earn, the whole family must earn a really rather modest amount um, in order to qualify. And we can also see from this graph here that it's increasing. So from each year, from 2021, to 2020 and 2021, there has been an increase in that proportion. And one might want to start to wonder, well, how are these students doing? Because they too will come from very poor families um, and will not have had the advantages of many of the students that we have been used to having in our higher education system. Um, and just to give you one of the findings from uh, Charles's analysis. Um, this is a graph showing the difference in success rates between NISPA students and non-NISPA students. And what I think is quite remarkable here is how close they all are. One or two percent, and in one case, actually the NISPA students are doing better. Um, we didn't have DUT's figures uh, in, in this particular case. Uh, but I do think it's a testament to um, South Africa's commitment to equity that we are achieving these sorts of results. And now back to our, I told you you'd get tired of this diagram. We have completed number one and just spoken about uh, the partners uh, and the participant members and some idea of the diversity and the inclusivity of those partner members. And now we'll move to our coaches. Um, our coaches are a remarkable group and this is something that we are particularly proud of. In Siapumalela 1, we had a coach from Achieving the Dream. Towards the end, we started to develop a South African cadre of co coaches. There were six of them, you can see all six of them here. Uh, Delicia Tim unfortunately has had to um, pull out because of other commitments. Um, and these coaches have been developed and have developed themselves um, through working collaboratively but also from a great deal of support from Achieving the Dream. Jan Lydon, our initial coach, has continued to be involved. I don't think she would have joined us um, because it is, I don't know, 2 a.m. in the morning in, um, where she lives. Um, but she has been a great help to us and as has um, the colleague coaches, each of our coaches has a colleague coach as well um, from Achieving the Dream. So we pay tribute to this amazing cadre and we hope that we'll be able to develop it further as we have more institutions um, who would like the service of, of a coach. Yesterday it was really interesting to hear how in the, in, in the part, uh, participant members um, they all pay tribute to the co coaches and the role that they have played in helping to shape the that, that we have managed. These services have revolved around three things, supporting students, uh, use of data for student success, and finally, transforming institutions. Um, many of these workshop, of the workshops were clustered around these three uh, themes, Let fewer of them on transforming institutions, but we'll come to that later. But it's really important to note that these services are only possible because of the contribution of the partners. So, say the